Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the TensorFlow re-implementation of the paper JaxNet. JaxNet is a paper uh, that works to classify and localize 14 different thoracic diseases based on the chest X-ray 14 data set. It's a 45 gigabyte data set and uh, it has, I think, around 800,000 images uh, of uh, three scans each per patient and uh, uh, it, along with a label for the uh, pathologies that they have. For instance, there's pneumonia, there's cardiomyology, and there is uh, 12 others uh, of which I have not a clue what they actually mean. But uh, the main idea behind it or what uh, the main gap we found when actually reading the paper was that uh, it uh, did not provide any source code. It didn't give us any reference to look at with respect to actually deploying the work that they have done in production. Uh, and it's especially important because this paper performed better than radiologists that are actually currently working, which is a big deal. So, as a result of that, our approach to this was basically to look at it like how can uh, how can we re-implement it, but not just in a way that we have a source code, but in a way that documents the entire process of developing the uh, the model. Right? We want to be able to track. We want anyone who is interested in this project to be able to open up the repository, look at different experiments that we've done, pull the data, reproduce it themselves. Come make comparisons between exp experiments that we have done that maybe we do not care to take a look at and maybe get something more additional out of it. So with respect to that, we have used a lot of uh, interesting techniques, additives over the initial reproductive aspect of the paper in order to ensure that the, that the factor wherein someone else can get something additional out of it is maintained. We've used tools like TVC and MLflow, which I'm sure uh, you folks will be more than familiar with. Uh, but yes, that said, the original paper is present at that link. And uh, the, to the right is an example implementation of what, what the input output should look like. You take an X-ray as an input and it gives you the, the, the uh, classification as well as a localization of that disease. So uh, with regards to the model itself, here are the main parameters that you would use in order to sort of develop a model similar to this. We have a dense net 121 model, a pre-trained model on ImageNet, which we use and fine tune on the chest X-ray protein data set. Uh, the output is a vector of binary classifications what that means is that it outputs either one of zero and one, four, and uh, it's basically it, it's basically what allows for multiple classification. So someone can have uh, uh, pneumonia and cardiomegaly at the same time, right? So those two will be one, and the red, the others will be zero, and. Uh, is the basic architecture. The optimizer uses Adam, and besides the learning rate, all of the parameters are default. Uh, the batch size that we use here is 16 with four different callbacks. Uh, we have a model checkpoint callback, the DAX hub caller callback, which is used for which we use for logging uh, metrics and evaluate and additional evaluation files. Uh, the reduced LRM plateau with a patience of only one epoch which reduces the learning rate by a factor of 10 uh, uh, if the accuracy does not improve. And finally, the CSV logger, which works in tandem with the tax logger, the log metrics. We use a binary cross entropy loss with the default parameters and train the model for 10 epochs. Um, with, uh, I also did have, okay, yes. One thing that I also wanted to mention and forgot to add in the slides was the mechanism for localizing the uh, for localizing the disease, right? We are using a technique called CAMS or class activation mappings. 
what uh, the technique fundamentally is is that we train a classification model with no additional uh, changes or uh, whatsoever and we extract the the layer weights of the model immediately before the uh, find uh, the dense layers and after the convolution layers so after global average pooling uh, we take the weights from those and use them in order to derive the areas that the model uses in order to make the classification, in order to make the classification. And on the basis of that, the uh, area that has the highest weight is what we determine to be the, uh, the, the area of the disease, which is why, which is the reason why those pixels within the screen are the most important to the neural network. And uh, yeah. So this was the entire sort of modeling pipeline that we have implemented. And uh, with respect to that, we have a couple of observations that we made towards that. There were a lot of uh, challenges that we had along the process of developing this. And uh, we're just going to detail two of those for now. So one interesting challenge that we have which is issue number 58 is uh, practically uh, embedded into memory at this point was uh, a challenge we faced during development wherein the model that uh, we had trained instead of producing uh, produced fairly uh, reasonable classifications However, when we went to explore the class activation mappings or localizations, of that model that we trained, we found that it always ended up localizing only towards the bottom of the of the image where the diaphragm was instead of the lung region itself. And a major cause of this issue was that we were training our model on a subsample data set, right? Out of the 45 gigabytes that we had initially, where it, we reduced that all the way down to a one gigabyte data set, we stratified it such that there were an equal number of, uh, or there about an equal number of images for each class. And uh, from there, we basically ended up uh, training it on that one gigabyte data set. The reason we trained on a subsample data set and the entire thing was to validate our process to see that we were going along the right track and hadn't made any critical errors because once we train it on our final big model, that would be a commitment basically, right? And it would cost a lot, uh, both time-wise and financially to restructure the work after we train the entire model and do that iteratively until we get everything right. So we used these uh, the subsample data set as a way of uh, figuring out or, or as a way of validating our approach. And as far as the metrics were concerned, we got a fairly representative uh, AUROC score and area under curve score. And, uh, but of course this was the issue. And we used a lot of different approaches. Initially, we assumed that our method for obtaining the class activation mappings was incorrect. We tried reproducing that separately. We uh, attempted to uh, read, uh, modify the batch size, learning rate, and basically tune hyperparameters a bit to see if that made any difference. And uh, finally, after sort of going around the entire thing and not finding any reasonable solution, uh, we ended up biting the bullet and just training it on the full data by uh, the full data set for only two epochs to just see if that made any difference. And it turns out that that was in fact the cause of the problem, as I guess I guess you would have figured out from the the header. Uh, so the stratified data set was the cause of the error in that it due to the fact that even though we had a subsample data set which was completely stratified and we had taken uh, we had taken proper care to ensure that there were the equal set of classes for everyone um it did not produce a correct uh, class activation mapping under the hood so that is something maybe to keep in mind when you are uh, trying to validate one of your own methods for instance and uh, just continuing from there these are the training metrics from the updated uh, from the full data set versus the one gigabyte data set that we were using one of the uh, one additional concern that you could know when we were training our initial model was that we had a, a higher learning rate 
for the one gigabyte data set, which could have also contributed to the fact that uh, the heat maps were not as accurate. We found out about the fact that it was incorrect further on, and that is the reason why we were unable to make that modification beforehand. And as you can see, of course, there is a very uh, significant increase with respect to at least uh, the AUC as well as a decrease in the loss, which is uh, completely, of course, attributed to the additional data set. Then uh, another one that we noticed that MLflow was actually very, very uh, helpful to us in you know finding out was that uh, there could be an overfitting problem, which was a, which basically uh, we retrained the full data set on uh, the learning rate of 0 0.01 and we found the validation AUC was fluctuating a lot and uh, we figured that this could be a symptom of overfitting which led us to read the paper one more time wherein we found out that we had noted the learning rate wrong it was actually 0 0.001 instead of just 0 0.01 and uh, the, that basically was a very good hint in that the ML flow, you know, showed us that since uh, the metrics that we have were fluctuating, there was something that we were either doing wrong or something that was an inherent cause of the paper. But step one was to look through the paper itself. And of course, we did find the solution eventually, which was good. Uh, but yeah, that is that. Then... After that, when it comes to evaluating our results, after we managed to train our entire model, we found the following, right? The original paper reports a mean ORAC of 0 0.841. They also had a more stratified uh, description of the ORAC scores as well, wherein they classified it per pathology basis. So they had one for each disease. And we are also in the process of evaluating that and presenting that. Uh, in But overall, our ROC was 0.874. We had a loss of 0.147 and 0.874, which is higher than the mean ROC reported by the original paper, by the way, which is really, really good. We had a loss of 0.147, LR, uh, 1 to the uh, 10 to the 10 raised to negative 5. Uh, validation or a 0.865 and a validation loss of 0.153. And uh, these are the metrics of our paper or our reproduction, I mean, as it currently stands. Um, anything, uh, something interesting to, okay, note here is that I have actually gotten the wrong uh, chart. This is the, this is the chart for, or this is the, this is this chart, the one with incorrect parameters, not the final one, uh, as the graph also shows, which explains the fact that the validation accuracy is or all of its fluctuating, fluctuating once again. Uh, this is, is something that is more representative. So yeah, <laughs> that. Um, finally, after getting metrics, the next step, obviously, uh, oh, also here is an example of the final fixed localization right uh, and the green bounding box is the why that was given that was provided by the authors of the paper that consulted radiologists uh, to determine their optimal bounding box for the classification uh, the the original paper did not provide results from the model so that uh, so our only point of comparison is the green bounding box for about 1,000, 1,500 or so images that they provided uh, after individually or manually uh, creating those bounding boxes. So this is an example of localization within the uh, within our final uh, model. And finally, after all that, we have deployment. So how we uh, how we are planning to deploy what we've built. And uh, Arjun, who is in here, unfortunately, would be a fantastic person to have spoken a bit about this. Uh, he has been working with MLflow, uh, MLflow's model registry, really digging into the details. And uh, he's basically using the artifact server to log all of the model or to log all of the training runs and creating an HTTP server or uh, using the model artifact that is then served on, a, on an AWS backend currently. Uh, and while this is currently internal, we do plan on releasing uh, it 
publicly, I, I assume. Uh, and uh, with uses Streamlit as a front end, which of course is incredibly uh, dynamic as we're all very, very aware that it, it works very, very well uh, for classification for classification and uh, a very large subset of problems. So, uh, or a large subset of tasks. So we're using MLflow as a model registry, AWS as a cloud backend, and Streamlit as our front end in order to obtain our final instance, which is really cool because since we're using a direct HTTP server that outputs the classification itself, you could theoretically just send a curl request to the server and get your final output back, which is super, super cool. And yeah, that is uh, what I have for you all today. Have an awesome rest of the day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I enjoyed uh, presenting this very much. The project repository is on daxup.com slash neerbarazida slash checksnet.git. And the slides are present at uh, cs.podu.edu slash homes, jsetpal slash checksnet.pdf. And yes, thank you so much. <laughs>